Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session of Ask Mark. Uh, in this series, we talk about service design and journey mapping software, and we answer your questions. And Mark and I are your hosts. Mark. Hi. I'm uh, Mark, co-founder and CEO of More Than Metrics, uh, a company building software for service design and customer experience management. Great. And I'm Nicole. I'm a service designer, and I also work with Mark and his team at More Than Metrics to help our clients adopt our software and embed and scale service design into their organizations. So today we are going to talk about experience research. We're going to discuss how research um, or how to research the experiences of customers, employees, citizens, or any stakeholders that are relevant to you. And we're going to talk about how we can use that data on journey maps. We've collected some questions beforehand from uh, some of you who have registered, um, but also if you're with us live today, you can put your questions directly in the chat. Um, you can put them in there anytime from now and we'll try to tackle all of them. Um, as you're sending us your questions, try to make them um, to all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists because we want other participants to be able to see your question as well and maybe that will trigger something else for them that they would like to ask kick off this time again with um with a few slides uh, a part of uh, of my overall presentation on, on in service design how to do research and so on and then maybe show uh, one of the methods uh, one of the research method that is that is closest to my heart where i'm really really passionate about since 12 years now um, because I developed it um, it was uh, part of my PhD it's a it's a long hard story um, I don't have a PhD I mean the title but I published loads of papers about that but I'm going to tell the story later it's actually quite um, quite funny a little bit of heartbreaking but that's what a good story makes right? <laughs> I haven't heard this story yet I'm really looking forward to it now <laughs> All right, let me share my screen with you. There we are. One of, one of the things that we want to find out is um, research about experience. But experiences we always need to understand in context. Uh, so I, I like to start with the context of it. And, and that is, for me at least, customer satisfaction. There's a very simple academic model for customer satisfaction. And that is called confirmation disconfirmation paradigm. And what it means is at any moment, um, we as humans, um, we compare our expectation with our experience. If they match, we're satisfied. If the expectation was higher than actually the experience, we're dissatisfied. If the experience is higher than the expectation, we are delighted. We are very satisfied. And this model suits perfectly a customer journey map. So all the steps you have until you actually start using a service, a physical product, digital product, um, drives your expectations. And then while you're using it during the service period, you actually compare it. And what you see later when, when you chat with people, when they share their experiences, maybe in, in social media, um, that's actually the result of that. So if you visualize the level of expectation, the level of experience, if they match, we're satisfied. But too often that happens, that the experience can't keep up with the expectation, which results in dissatisfaction. Or that we drove expectations too high, often a problem of siloed organization. It might be a really great team in marketing and sales that others can't actually keep up with. So they're over-promising meaning dissatisfaction. So what we try to understand when we do research is, do we only want to focus on the bit of experience? Do we want to understand the satisfaction through the result of it? Or are we looking at the entire journey, the end-to-end -end journey, including the expectations? The level of expectation is very different according to different groups you do research on. So that's what we use personas for, to understand what is the level of expectation there. What we can do, obviously, is we can increase the experience or we can decrease their expectation. There's something very human, actually. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure every one of you uh, did it before. When you invite someone over for dinner, what do you tell them? Just think about that. Did you tell them that you're going to stand in the kitchen for hours trying to prepare the best meal ever? Or did you tell them, I try something new and not sure if it works? Or it, 
just do a little bit, don't expect too much. So we're leveling down expectation, that's something very human. And we can use that also in service design to set a level of expectation. The result of that very often is the emotional journey. We're actually at every step of the journey, we constantly match our expectation with our experience. So constantly we could measure how satisfied people are. We see patterns in that. And I'll show you later a tool that helps you to actually exactly do that. But let's talk about research. So research is one of the activity, one of the core activities in, uh, in service design. It, I think, it is the core activity in service design because if you don't really understand user needs, if you don't really understand what the problem is, you might design great products, great services that no one needs. So research is at the core of what we're doing. Um, and I just give you a really rough overview of, of process and different, different methods we use. And if I work with clients, they're often very familiar with any kind of quantitative methods. They, they're good at doing surveys. They're good at tracking users. Um, so any kind of big data they do. What, what they're sometimes hesitant to do is uh, qualitative research. And, and I don't think it's, it's either or. And, and I don't think there should be a fight because both suit a different purpose. We need quantitative research to monitor on KPIs over time to see how are we doing? Are we increasing? Are we decreasing? Do we have a problem in, in a specific channel maybe? But we need qualitative research to actually get actionable insights to understand why we see certain effects in quantitative research. And the methods we use there are, are very, very diverse both in quant and in qual. So I won't go into, into all the methods now, but I give you one big tip. If you do any kind of research, particularly qualitative research, how do you get to good quality results with limited budgets? Because that is one of the issues every organization has. We don't have enough budget to do proper qualitative research, maybe on an academic level. But what we can learn from academia, and that goes back to the 70s, is a concept called triangulation. Because every research method, all the methods I'm going to talk about in a minute, have a bias in there. The only way to level out these biases is by using different methods. If you do an interview, people will never tell you the truth. They, they, they give you answers that are socially acceptable, or that they think will please you simply because they're nice. We're nice humans. People will behave differently as soon as they are part of a research project. It's called the researcher bias. And there are loads and loads of these biases out there. So the only way to level it out is by using different research methods. Also use different data types. So how do you actually collect your data? In which form? Do you take notes, so text? Do you take photos or videos or audio files? Do you make sketches? Do you collect artifacts? The richer your set of data types are, the better and more robust your research is because it allows you to do the third level of triangulation, which is researcher triangulation. We always talk about slipping into the shoes of our customers, but we forget that we are all wearing our own shoes. So again, to level out biases of us as researchers, we actually need different researchers. And the only way to understand data that other people collected is by having a rich data set. So you not only depend on the data that someone wrote down, but that you can take a look at a video or photo or audio file or an artifact and so on. So here are a few examples of research methods um, that we like to use in, in service design when we um, try to understand customer experience, customer expectations. We like to do contextual interviews. So interviews in the situative context. And, and you might think, well, right now with the a, with a COVID-19 situation, that's not possible because we can't go out. But maybe you as a researcher can't be present there. In some countries you can, you just have to keep a physical distance. But you can use your smartphone, do video calls in these situations. So get as close as possible as you can. We use non-participant observation. The nickname for that is the fly on the wall, where you observe situations, where you learn from body language, from processes that you see, and so on. 
we use a very traditional uh, ethnographic approaches like participant observation. The nickname of it is shadowing, where we follow people throughout their process. And we do that also with employees. Again, I think I say that in every, every session that we do here. Customer experience is just one part. At least as important is employee experience. And you need to understand the experience of your employees. That's why we do work a lot. Shadowing of employees, working together with them, kind of an internship. If I, if I talk to management, I often sell it through this traffic TV series, Undercover Boss. We do the same thing. We, we don't use a fake mustache or something. But you, you really need to get as close as possible to your front line. Because that is really that makes or breaks a customer experience. We use new approaches like mobile ethnography, and I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on that in a, in a few moments. And very simple technologies like auto ethnography, that basically means become a customer yourself. So what we do with that data? We collect primary data, and of course, we also use secondary data, so any kind of data that uh, you already have. And what we try to achieve is we try to come up with interpreted data, stuff like key insights, user stories, jobs to be done, whatever you might be using. And one way to get there is through visualizations. And that's where our tools come into play, our personas, our system maps, our journey maps. They help us to make sense of data, to synthesize data, to analyze it. The first step often when we do research is we need to visualize that. So we actually collect the data and make it tangible on the wall. Creating a research wall is great. You can also do that, um, of course, digitally. Um, the last thing on my, on my presentation is when we, when we go out, we often start with explorative research. So we want to learn something new. We want to get answers uh, why we see certain effects. Hopefully you go out without assumptions, with an open mind. As soon as you have these kind of interpreted data, key insights, jobs to be done and so on, you might want to do confirmatory research where you actually do maybe a quantitative research afterwards to confirm what you've learned. But that's optional. What you need to do is Whenever you work with tools like journey maps, when you start with assumption based tools, so without research, you need to do research to actually base it on research because it's so dangerous to take decisions just based on assumptions. All right, enough of the slides. Now I would like to give you a very quick overview of my most favorite research tool. Um, and that is our tool experience fellow. And the, the research method behind that is called mobile ethnography. And this is something I developed since 2008. And it's, it's part of my PhD. I'm still doing it. And at some point, I'm going to finish it. I published loads of paper, but I, I never actually put it together and, and, and pass it on. Um, so whenever I do talks like this, I'm afraid that my PhD supervisor will watch this and, and think like, okay, when does he finally finish that stuff? Um, yes, well, the, the, at some point reality overtook theory. So instead of finalizing my PhD, I started a, a company uh, together with Klaus and Jacob and, and that's where we are now, Experience Fellow. So the first version of Experience Fellow actually started as an academic tool in 2008. It was completely free to use until 2013. And only then we actually converted that into, into a startup. So what it allows to you, mobile ethnography, is you can invite participants, and that can be users, that can be customers, can be citizens, and it also works great with employees. You can invite them to join your project uh, through an app. And then what they do is on the app, they actually take kind of a diary study where they can take a new uh, step and, and document it with text, photos, videos, with a, uh, with a uh, five point Likert scale of satisfaction, importance, and so on. And you as a researcher, you get this data in real time visualized as journey maps. I would like to show you 
briefly how this looks like. So this is from a demo project um, on the public transport experience in Amsterdam. And what you see here are, um, are 14 different participants. And the typical thing is that if you stop after two or three steps, around 50% dropout rate, and others give you a lot of data. And what you see then immediately is actually what was positive in the journey and what was negative. So remember the emotional journey, that's exactly what you get out of this. And then you have loads and loads of different ways how to, how to tag the data, uh, how to go through it, how to work with it, look at it on the map, uh, see where people documented it. You can zoom in, take a look, and sometimes you see clusters of negative experience, clusters of positive experience. And then you can again look at the qualitative data behind it to find like, why was that positive? What's the story here? The nice thing about this uh, way of doing research is you don't need to be present by doing the research. So currently it just goes bananas because people start using it during this situation because they are looking for ways how to do remote research. And what it also does is you can do research projects with loads and loads of participants, even with hundreds of participants. But it's still a qualitative approach because you have photos, videos, uh, text and so on connected to that. Enough from that, uh, and I was talking way too long, so I stopped sharing my screen and look forward to all your questions. Okay, we have a couple questions that we got um, before we started, so I'm going to start there. Um, huh, let me see here. When do you suggest what user experience research methods you should use? How? How do I choose? Yeah, so the, the, the first thing is uh, never use just one method. Always use um, two or three methods. So think about triangulation. And um, I just look in, my, uh, in, 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 our, in our little book, because what I, what I, if you look for the research chapter there, um, you will find five different categories that I put the, the research methods into. And I suggest to take, if you take two or three methods, one method from different category each. So the categories are, the first one is desk research. Desk research means um, any kind of research you do at home with Google Scholar, with asking colleagues, finding existing research in your organization and so on. The second one are self-ethnographic approaches. So that is something like autoethnography, online ethnography, and so on. The third category are participant approaches. So participant approaches is something uh, like uh, participant observation, contextual interviews, and so on. Number four are non-participant approaches. So that is something like mobile ethnography, for example, or non-participant observation. And the fifth category is something that people often do not think about when they, when they hear research. Category number five are co-creative workshops. Co-creative workshops are a research method. Think about a journey mapping workshop. You can invite 10, 20 customers and create a journey map together or several journey maps together. You do this to learn from your participants and that's actually a valid research method. So I recommend to not only choose the right method, but choose two or three from different categories. And then think in research loops. So don't collect all your data first and then start analysis, but rather do a quick loop, maybe an hour, maybe a few hours, and check back if the methods you picked are actually working. Do they bring data that is valuable for you? If not, change your method. Mark, I would also add to that the um, doing a journey mapping workshop with your users as a research method. If you need bang for your buck, that is such a great way to go. I mean, that's one of my go-tos when I have a tight budget, I can afford to get out there, I can do some interviews, I can maybe, maybe have a handful of people do a diary study, but I really just need to get good bang for my buck and make those dollars stretch. I can get 15, 20 people in a room for an hour and a half. I just need to buy them pizza maybe or give them a little gift card as a thank you. And it's really, really quick and you just get 
so much information. It's Anyway, I wanted to drive that one home. I think it's a good one. <laughs> it is, it is. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, that's great because you answered someone else's question who was asking about examples of ethnographic research. Well, did I tell um, examples of it? I don't think so. I think you kind of did. Maybe, maybe you could give some real world examples. Yeah. I think you talked about types. So, uh, Go for it. You, <laughs> so I could I could share loads of stories, but I will share one story that I that I particularly like, um, and and that is um, a story connected to the the image you just saw for when when I talked about contextual interviews, um, and and I, I use this photo to remind me of this story. Actually, I was I was working for a manufacturer of ticket machines. Um, so these were ticket machines for like um, for train tickets, for, for subways and so on. And when I started working with them, um, in, I, I asked them, how do you do your user research? And they, they were very proud and they said, oh, we have a new lab. We have a new research lab. And they showed me the, the research lab and it was absolutely fantastic. It has cameras everywhere, sensors, face recognition, you could like analyze if, if people were smiling or if they were confused and so on. But I then asked them and I challenged them, like, do you also do any kind of contextual research? And I said, no, why? We have a lab. We invite people to come to us. That's way more convenient for us. And, and yes, that I understand it's more convenient, but the issue with that is in a lab, you can only ask the questions that you know, that you are aware of. So I challenged them and asked them, should we go out and do some contextual research to see if we come up with new things that you're not familiar with in an hour? And, and they were a little bit hesitant at the beginning, but then they said, yeah, sure, let's go out. So we went out and it took half an hour or so until the following situation appeared. There was a, a young lady with her daughter and uh, her shopping bags. She was standing in the queue until it was her turn at the ticket machine. And, and when it was her turn, she put down the, the bags, she entered the ticket she wanted, she paid with credit card, she entered the credit card, entered the pin. In the moment when she had entered her pin, her daughter ran away. So now the mother had to take a decision, daughter or credit card. Obviously, it's credit card, so it's not, don't worry, don't worry. She ran after her daughter. But it, it's not a situation you want to put your user in. And the system was not designed to cancel in this moment. And, and for the research, it was like, okay, that's something we never thought about. And, and that's the thing. If you, if you do contextual research, you discover things that you never thought about. It's exploratory research. Once you're aware of that, you can think about a prototype in a lab and then do evaluative research if the solution works. But at some point, you want to go out again. So that's just one tiny story. But you can do uh, experience research. We did it in, in hotels. We did it for airlines. Um, we did it for governments. Uh, so it's, it's a very vast field. You can actually research anything. And I would say all of that is very useful. I'd say that's also a really important go-to method for service designers to make sure that you have at least one of your methods, if not more, that put you in context of what is happening. Um, okay, I have another question here in the chat from Stefan. How do you calculate the cost for each research method? Is there a way to easily calculate it for every existing research method? Estimation is the right thing, right? It's, it's... Yeah. Because it, it includes one big aspect. And, and the big aspect is how many people do you ask? Um, how many people do you need to ask? And that's a big difference between quantitative research and qualitative research. Because in quantitative research, you can calculate upfront how many people do I need to ask to have a representative sample size. In qualitative research, we do not do this because we, we use a different concept there. Qualitative research doesn't care if people have like 72.4% or 72.3% of, of our users have this problem. We want to find out what are the five biggest issues people have and maybe end up with a ranking of these. So we use a different concept there. And the concept there is called theoretical saturation. 
theoretical saturation means if you ask that say 20 people and out of these 20 people there is a clear pattern in your in your data like there are three big problems and the 21st one you ask just confirms what you already know the 22nd confirms just what you know then you reach theoretical saturation which means asking more people will not bring you any new results it just confirms what you already know your theory is saturated the probability that after 20 25 people who really strongly showed a pattern that the next 20 25 people you ask tell you something completely different is neglect neglectable if you selected your participants randomly that's very important there. If you ask 25 friends, it might be different, but if you select it randomly, no worries. So how do you estimate upfront how, do you, uh, how many people you need to ask? You don't know. And that's the thing, because the, um, the strength of the effects will, um, will determine how many people you need to ask. If they are not three big issues, if you have three big issues, maybe 10 people are enough and, and, and it confirms you reach the theoretical saturation. If there are 20 minor issues, then it takes longer to reach the theoretical saturation. That's why it is so hard to calculate the costs upfront for every method. However, what you can do is you can calculate a minimum, like what is the minimum amount of people you need to ask? My minimum is always like 10 to 20. That's the minimum. That's something you always should, should ask, observe, and so on. Um, and, and have this minimum and maybe think about a worst case scenario. And uh, probably the reality is in the middle there. And that helps you to estimate it. But it's, it's, it's really hard to say upfront how much it costs. So have a budget, start with two or three research, uh, research methods see if you can find a pattern if you if a pattern emerges confirm it through a few more and see if it also get confirmed through the other research methods if you work in that way at least you don't spend too much money or waste money with doing a lot of research that no one needs and that always happens if you work um, if you do first your data collection and then afterwards do the data analysis so think in loops and, and the closer or the, the, the faster these loops are, the higher the probability that you identify your pattern early enough in your process. Okay, Mark, it is 29 after the hour. Gosh, so I talk too much, sorry. I know, it just goes so fast, that's okay. We appreciate you. Um, but I'm gonna take one more question here. Yes. So this is from Marius. Hi, say someone else collected the data how do you review it to highlight assumptions without questioning their abilities? <laughs> it's, it's almost a political question. Um, a little tricky. It, it, it is. Um, so triangulation is again a thing there. Um, if, one of the things is I, if, if I have to work with data from other people, I, I first look if they follow like basics of doing good quality research, which is triangulation. Did they use different methods, different researches, um, and, and different data types. If you find a strong pattern within this triangulation, say there is one researcher that finds out certain things, and it's only this one researcher, it's, it's probably hard not to question their ability. Uh, very often, um, there is a hidden agenda in play. It might be that there is someone from senior management who wants to make a point about something. Could be. Um, but triangulation is the best way to do it. And, and the nice thing about that is you can, you can just show the data and let the data speak and say, look, we found these things. We can triangulate, triple triangulation, methods, researchers, data type. We can be pretty sure that this actually exists. These other points, we have doubts because there were only single people finding it. And if you visualize that, if you really show that, the data will speak for itself. Um, but it is a political thing. If you, if you set it up, that was a follow, I'm, I'm just stopping because I read the follow, uh, follow up question. And if they didn't follow basic research yeah. practice, <laughs> at some point you have to tell people that they didn't follow 
basic research question, uh, practice, I guess. Um, I mean, honestly, if, if you have crappy data, you can't come up with great insights from crappy data. And if, if you have a very biased data set, all your results will be very biased in that direction. That's why we have these standards of, of doing good qualitative research. Um, at some point, you, you have to tell people that this doesn't work, even if it's hard. I don't have a good, um, good answer for that, but... I, yeah. I love Marius's response though, uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> Great, thank you. I mean, there's, uh, it's hard if, if you want to save your job, babies. you know what, what, what you have to do, right? But the uh, uh, question is, like, what, what's more important? Mm. Values yeah, uh, are only values if you stick to them, even if it hurts. For sure. Okay, I lied. Let's do two more questions, but they're, they're specific about experience fellow, and I think you can answer them quickly. Okay. So, Heiko would like to know if we recommend that customers should or could also use the experience fellow app and yes the absolutely. Answer is yes absolutely it's it's actually great to do with customers um depending on the context you you need an incentive for them to participate why should they participate obviously it's, it's like any other research method uh, you always need to think about how to incentivize people so they're motivated to take part but yes absolutely okay great i mean that really that's what it was designed for yeah, it was quick. Um, and then the other one, I think I also know the answer to. Um, Steve, he says he loves the GPS element of Experience Fellow, but you currently have to enter the experience point to trigger the GPS recording. Can we get a full GPS map that records a full route without having to record all the experience points? Nope. You can't. And we have a few um, good reasons for that, right? And, and that was actually by design, yes. Because uh, we want yeah. that people are in control of that. Um, and, and, and that's why. Um, you can even set up project without uh, GPS or without taking the ability to take photos or videos. So uh, th there were research projects, for example, done in hospitals uh, where it's, it's data privacy is a really, really big issue. Um, and, and you can, it works for that. Um, but yeah, no, we, we put a limit there. We said, no, it's, uh, it should be triggered and, and not um, used to spy on yeah. people or whatever. Privacy is a big one. I think too, if you live somewhere like where I live in Canada, data costs a lot of money and I would not be willing to participate in a study that means my GPS is running the whole time that app is there because it costs me a fortune. Yeah. 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 Data is not cheap. So I think that that's another. I thought we were just over having that. it trigger those points. We are, we are moving towards being over it. We are not over it yet. <laughs> okay. We have, um, just to let you know that our next session, uh, coming up in about a month is going to be about journey map repositories. So we're going to talk about, how once you've got a lot of maps in your organization, how you can link them to each other, um, how you can technically build that repository, and then just how having that repository is going to help you in your business. So it's a really exciting topic. We're seeing definitely lots of our clients realizing they have a lot of maps and that they need to come together in some usable way. So we're going to help with that challenge uh, in about a month's time. And awesome. you can sign up for our next session um, on our blog. And if you've got any questions, you can send them to mail at morethanmetrics.com. Perfect. Send us questions up front. That's, yeah. um, that's really yes. important. Awesome. Thanks Thank for you. being with us. And uh, see you next time. Thanks. Stay safe. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>